This is the Sony Pocket Station, and it's fantastic. Look at these people. They're dancing because they love it so much. But maybe you don't know what the Pocket Station is, and judging by the Reddit comments, there are a fair few that don't. Instead of me wasting your time telling you things you've probably already worked out from the footage playing right now, I'll just show you it in action with PS1 games it's compatible with and explain the rest along the way. If you bought a copy of Final Fantasy VIII back in 1999 for the PS1, when you look through the manual, be it the American version or the European version with the superior cover art, seriously America, you got some of the worst cover art imaginable. Anyway, the manual told you how to use the Sony Pocket Station with Final Fantasy VIII as a way to play a cool little mini game to earn extra items. Then, at the top corner of the page, it slapped you in the face with this. You will never get this, you will never get this, la 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 la. Maybe you didn't read the manual, maybe you just played the game, completed the Chocobo Forest section, and then the save game basically flipped you the bird. The Sony Pocket Station never did get released outside of Japan. Sony's answer to the Sega Dreamcast VMU, like all the best stuff at the time, was kept away from Western gamers, and only us lucky few who had access to the internet and who were prepared to jump through some Lick Sang shaped hoops were actually able to ever use one. But those that did found a fun little PlayStation 1 memory card size handheld mini system, which had an LCD screen, sort of PlayStation style button layout, could keep the time, had an alarm, worked as a PS1 memory card, but most importantly, could play special mini games that were saved into certain PS1 discs. And Final Fantasy VIII was one such disc. Once you had completed the Chocobo Forest section, a new option appeared in the save game menu. This would allow you to add the Chocobo World Gamer detailed in the manual to your pocket station. And when you select it, start it, start downloading the game to your handheld, you get this brilliant chip tune version of the Chocobo theme to listen to while the data is transferred over. Once it's done, you're now in control of where your Chocobo is, be it whether he's in the main game with you on the PS1, or if he's over on the Pocket Station doing stuff there. So what does he do on the Pocket Station? Well, you get a map, and the flashing dot is your Chocobo's position. The solid dots are points of interest. There might be a battle, which is a number game which I still don't really understand, or a piece of treasure. It's the treasure you are after, because once you plug the Pocket Station back into the console, console and return your chocobo back from your handheld to the PS1 game, any treasure you found while in portable mode gets handed over to your party members. And to add insult to Western Final Fantasy VIII players, there are some items in the game that can only be found via the pocket station. Great. Although the later PC port didn't require a pocket station to get these items, if you bought the game as a PS1 classic via the PlayStation 3's PSN store, you got the full 1999 experience once again, because this version is the digital version of the PS1 game, and there is no way at all to connect a pocket station to the PS3. Even when, like me, you actually have the Japanese-only US USB memory card reader because even though the PS3 knows when a pocket station's plugged in, won't actually let you use it while a game is running because Sony are a bunch of idiots.
Right, now you've seen me using an actual pocket station in all its shaky camera glory, I'm going to use emulation for the rest of this video so it actually looks decent. And talking about looking decent, this is Ray Crisis by Taito. This is an arcade game from 1998 that is running on Taito's Gnet arcade board. And if you said to yourself, Hey, that looks like a PS1 game. Well, you wouldn't be far wrong, as Gnet is one of the 16 arcade boards produced that are basically PS1 hardware. And because it's almost identical hardware, home conversions require less effort than Bethesda's bug testing department. So yes, there is a PS1 version, and normally this is the sort of game I'd really like. Give me something like Pop and Twimby or Thunder Force 4, and I'm a happy man. But here, a lot of the time, projectiles seem to blend in with the background and I get caught short. Anyway, you can see the pocket station clock screen in the corner. Not that it's really showing anything important right now, but you're gonna see it there all the time now because that's how I've got the emulator set up, so I know it's working. However, if I go back to the title screen and then enter the options mode, within the memory card menu, I have an option to add a mini game to the pocket station for what would be portable play. While it's uploading the game to the device, you can see on the pocket station screen that a transfer is is happening. What is cool is that now I can open the pocket station in a separate window and use it like I would normally. The game that Ray Crisis has added is called Pocket Ray and it's a simple top-down lock-on shooter. So you highlight the enemy ships with the crosshair and then fire once you have as many as you can highlighted. You keep going until you miss one and it flies off the screen. And if you're expecting more than this, well, no. Plus, this doesn't even affect the main PS1 game in any way that I can see either. So yeah, have fun with that. The problem with showing the next game is that it's golf, and just like in real life, when you're the one playing, it's great fun, but if you're just watching, it's the most boring thing in the world. This is a shame, as I really like the Everybody's Golf series games, and the one I'm now showing is the Japanese version of the second game called Mina no Golf 2. Like I say, I won't sit on this footage too long because you'll just fall asleep. Anyway, in the main menu, if you select the home page option, you get an option that says download. Doing this will bring up the pocket station menu and from here you can add a Minan Nogolf mini game to your pocket station. Like me, you might be hoping for something like golf on the Game Boy, but on the pocket station, guess what? It's actually better than that, only because golf on the Game Boy is a hot steaming turd. What we've actually got here is a see how far you can hit the ball mini game. That's it, have fun with that one. Although I guess it's pretty good that it only takes up five blocks on the pocket station, so you've got room for other stuff on it. Later on in this video, we'll look at Dokodemo Isho. That takes up the entire storage of the pocket station, so five blocks isn't that bad. Let's just get one thing out the way first. Of all the different versions of Street Fighter, the Alpha or Zero games are the best ones. Even better than Street Fighter 6, and you can poke your Street Fighter 3 where the sun don't shine. And the PS1 conversion of Street Fighter Zero 3 is almost arcade perfect. Just missing a few frames of animation, but it more than makes up for it with its brilliant World Tour mode. But something good can always be improved upon, and if you have a pocket station, you can take well tour mode on the road. You start the game and at the options menu, obviously select the pocket station mode, then select which character you'd like to send to the pocket station to train up. With this done, you can now head on over to handheld mode to see what's up. What you have now in your hand is Pocket Zero. It's basically a series of mini games you can play to level up a character for well tour mode. You have a game where you need to hit the targets and avoid the spikes to earn points. Then you have this bomb game where I'm pretty sure the idea is to press the button and the fuse on the bomb goes out and you want the minimum amount of fuse wire left before you press the button to earn the most points. There is other stuff to do like view your stats or play against another pocket station via the infrared link but I'm sure you get the idea of what's going on here now. So at this point you head back to the Japanese version of Street Fighter 03 on your PS1 and create a new world tour file 
from the Pocket Station game. You can now kick the pants off computer opponents using the character from your Pocket Station. As you play on your PS1, your stats will increase, and once you're done, you can send your character back to the Pocket Station to continue leveling up in handheld mode. Capcom really went all in on making a great package here. Well done, Capcom. You know what gamers want. This is Tokamiki Memorial 2, the follow-up to the game that was covered by Tim Rogers on his Action Button YouTube channel in a video that went super viral. I'm hoping you've seen it, because if you have, then you know how much of a big deal this game is. If you haven't watched it, then you're missing out one of the best videos on this entire website. I wouldn't even be angry if you stopped watching this video and put that on. It's that good. So let's assume at this point you know about Tokamiki Memorial 2, the Japanese-only Konami game Game that is a dating simulator on the surface, but under the cute anime girls lurks an ocean deep strategy game created by the people that bought a Snatcher, Rocket Knight Adventures, and Castlevania. You level up a character in a number of different ways to try to appeal to girls and get them to like you. Your guy has many different stats to level up, and there is an array of activities to level those stats. So when you mention pocket station capability, you might instantly imagine a portable mini game that is somehow going to aid you with this stat leveling. I mean, the people that made this game are super talented and are responsible for some of the best games ever, so surely they would implement some sort of feature that was at least on par with what Capcom did with Street Fighter Zero 3, right? No! This is possibly the biggest missed opportunity on this list. An absolute blockbuster title with a super talented group of staff behind it and an obvious use case for the Pocket Station should have added up to one of the best pieces of pocket station software right well if a talking alarm clock was what you're hoping for then congratulations because that's what the pocket station functionality in tokamiki memorial 2 is <laughs> I even went through the manual to make sure this is all you could do. Why? Why would Konami do this? This wasn't even the rubbish Konami we have today. This was good Konami. This was Metal Gear Solid, Castlevania and Bishy Bashy Special Konami. So the World Stadium games are both a home console series and an arcade series, and here the Pocket Station can be used to bring them both together. This here is World Stadium 3 on the PS1. It's baseball. I know it looks like it should be fun, but it's still just boring old baseball. But within the game, there's an option to create your own character, train him, and then export him to the Pocket Station. I can see the option to start the mode, but at no point does it ever seem to actually want to export my custom character. Now, I mentioned that World Stadium was also an arcade game, and this right here is World Stadium 2000, which was released into Japanese arcades around the same time as World Stadium 3 came to the PS1. This game was loaded into a special cabinet called CyberLed 2, which had something called a slot link system. What this amounts to is that the arcade cabinet had PS1, memory card slots, and Dreamcast VMU slots on the front. So yes, you could plug a PS1 memory card into the arcade cabinet. I've gone as far as to research the promotional material that came in the box with this arcade board and it clearly shows the game interacting with a Sony Pocket Station. Unless you're a complete idiot, it's pretty obvious that the idea here is that you could create a custom character on your home game, then using your Pocket Station, you could bring him to the arcades to play with him there as well. But I guess even if I did find the correct way to export my character to my emulate Pocket Station, God knows how I would have transferred that data over to MAME. It's a shame I couldn't figure this one out, but I found enough information to know it was definitely a thing that did happen. Now we move from a pants game with a great pocket station feature to a fantastic game with a really weak pocket station function. I love Ridge Racer, and so do you. And if you don't, what's wrong with you? The moment you figure out how the drifting works on this one is the moment you can't put this one down. It's a brilliant driving game, although I think I do prefer the mid 90s style of the first games over this. But either way, I don't know what I was expecting in the way of pocket station functions here, and yet somehow I still feel disappointed. So in the menu, there is an option to download a Pocket Station applet. And even the term applet seemed to suck any hope I had for this away. So what does it do? The Pocket Station lets you trade cars 
with another Pocket Station user. Wow. So if you have cars from Ridge Racer 4 in your garage and you'd like to trade them, just find another Pocket Station user in the same situation and you can swap cards using the infrared sensor on the handheld. Yeah, I'll get right on that. Capcom must have really liked the Pocket Station as they did actually something worthwhile again with another one of its fighting games, this time Rival Schools 2. Although it's the Japanese version so it's called something I'm not even going to try and say. Anyway, as you played either the arcade mode or the extremely long story mode, you would earn credits. Credits could be spent in the shop on unlockables. Now, playing the main modes is a super slow way to earn credits, even if the arcade mode is really fun because the combat in the game is superb and it has Sakura from Street Fighter Alpha in it. It's much quicker to grind the minigame section, namely the baseball and volleyball minigames to earn credits much faster. Or you could do what I did and just download a save file from game FAQs and unlock everything in seconds. One of the unlockables is a pocket station game which when downloaded will let you skill up your character in story mode and earn yet even more credits. Although I've just ruined it because my dodgy save file is everyone on max stats anyway. This is Pop of Music 2 from Konami, and trying to play this on a standard controller is doable on the easy levels, but once you get to the hard levels, it pretty much demands that you have the dedicated controller for this, otherwise your brain will melt. This is clearly a rhythm action game. It's actually one of Konami's big series of games that never really got far out of Japan, but inside Sony's homeland, it was actually a big deal and was super popular for quite a long time. So what are we expecting here from the Pocket Station? Another Konami alarm? clock some sort of high score sharing utility no nope, konami have actually included a mini version of popper music that you can play on the go god knows how you play it though i didn't get time to see which button corresponds to which music line so i just end up mashing all the buttons this however is not a tactic that actually works honestly konami i know there are five buttons on here but you really should have went with just four of them one two three four at least this would have made sense to what you see on the screen because right now this button here this could mean anything so thanks but no thanks Finally, we have the marquee game for the system. This is Doko Demo Ishio. It features the official PlayStation mascot, Toro Inore. And this entire game was made with the Pocket Station in mind from the start. Now, I fully covered this game using real hardware in a previous video. So here we go with some recycling. The first time you boot this game up, after you see the title screen, you'll get this Pogapi selection screen. Pogapi is just one of the words the Japanese have made up by mashing two other words together. In this case, the words pocket and people have been unceremoniously slammed together to form Pogapi. We have Toro Inoue, who outside Japan is simply known as Sony Cat. Obviously, he's the main character, and I'll go into detail about him as I play the game. But we can also select a robot called R. Suzuki, who has a four-sided head, which has a different emotion on each side, and he will rotate it to show you what he's feeling at any given time. Next, we have Jun Mahara, who is a rabbit. She's trendy, up to date on her pop culture, and a bit pretentious. She's a self-described love expert being a rabbit and all that. After that, we have Ricky, who is a green frog, who loves sports and dreams of being a world famous fighter. He likes to work out and he's always training to get stronger. Finally, we have Pierre Yamamoto, who is a half French, half Japanese dog. He dreams of living his life in France. Once you've selected your Pogapi that you want to use, you now have to give your little guy a name. This is done using an on-screen pocket station, and thankfully, if you scroll to the side, you'll find English letters. The next Step is putting details about yourself, your name, your gender, your birthday, your blood type, and your telephone number. With all this out the way, the game will now create a Pogapi mini game for the Pocket Station based on the information you have just entered, and then you can begin. Day one started for me with Toro entering his room, turning on the lights, and he begins talking. He tells me his name is Keb, which is the name I gave him, and that he dreams of becoming human. 
Now, I don't actually think he means he wants to transform from being a cat into a human. I'm pretty sure he actually means he wants to learn what it means to be human and sort of mimic that. So his idea is to study humans and he wants me to teach him about human things. Now I have control, but if I don't touch the controller, Toro will meander around the room, watch TV, listen to music and a bunch of other stuff. If at any point I press the action button, it strikes up a conversation with Toro. Most of the time this will result in a question, which I can normally answer yes or no. But if I press the menu button, I can now give Toro something to eat, check his stats, or most importantly, teach him a word. And this is the key part of the game. You type a word in, and thankfully you can select from English letters, then you have to tell him what it means by using a menu system. So I've told him the word apple, and then I have to choose if it's something famous, a person, a place, an activity, a food, an animal, and so on. Within each option, there's a whole bunch of new menus lurking underneath where I can go into much further detail. I messed up here with apple and totally selected the wrong option option because at first I didn't see I could scroll down on the first menu for more descriptions and I've told him that Apple is an activity. Now I've got myself into a bit of a mess because I have to define how many people can do Apple as an activity at once and now he's got totally the wrong idea about apples. <laughs> Don't make this mistake because the meanings and words that you teach Toro will be remembered and he'll use the words you teach him in future conversations as well as asking you questions around them. So if you tell him apples is some sort of three person group activity, then you're going to have some very bizarre conversations in the coming days. I spoke to him a bit more, I gave him some food and he went to sleep. I saved the game and turned the PlayStation off, then continued on with my day with Toro now in my pocket. When I checked on him again, he was still asleep, but I wasn't having none of that. So I woke him up and began a conversation with him about food. What I can't do though is any of the link up stuff that is outlined in the game's manual. Pocket stations can communicate with each other and two pocket stations with Dokodema Ishio can link and you can swap learned words with each other and play a word association game called Shiratori. What I can do though is teach him more words using pretty much the same interface as before and start a conversation with him. Even though Toro is an adult cat, he has a very childlike wonder about himself and he seems to like to play around. On day two, I booted up the PlayStation and noticed that a new poster had appeared in the background of Toro's apartment, as well as another banner on the other side of the room. As the pocket station has a clock built into it, the game can measure real world time and things will appear in the game the longer that you play it. Anyway, I gave him something to eat, then I got to see another room when the camera followed Toro when he went to the toilet. I taught Toro more words and even tried some words that I thought might have some special bonus to them. There was no special bonus. I looked in Toro's diary and he had written an entry about the previous day. I took him back into handheld mode again and he seemed to need the toilet quite a bit. Maybe I fed him some food he didn't like. I also refrained from putting the included stickers all over my pocket station. Although later I did put a few on my PC. That will annoy the people that love to keep their games complete in box. On day three, I began by looking into Toro's diary to see what he'd written about the day before. And then I got a look at his apartment and even more stuff was in it. Taught him a few new words, had a conversation with him about some food that he likes. His apartment has got even more stuff in now. And when you compare it to day one, you can see quite the difference. And what gets put into his apartment is different on every new playthrough. When I moved back into handheld mode, I could see Toro was in a very good mood and he was running around. I'm pretty sure he was happy when I was talking to him too. I found translating the pocket station text quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> 